Hello, Aggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. I have a question here from Stuart, K7STB. He says, Dave, I just bought a 1930s house that doesn't have a utility ground that I can find, and the topsoil is about 18 to 24 inches deep over solid basalt bedrock. Basalt, by the way, means that it's over area that used to be volcanic, Okay, otherwise it would be granite, but what comes up out of the volcanoes and spills down lava is basalt, okay? It's what coats the ocean floors. The continents actually float over this. They're made of granite. What is the best way to get an effective ground with such shallow soil? Well, first of all, 1930s. The question is, has the wiring in your home been updated? A lot of the older homes do not have three-prong outlets, only two-prong, okay? Those are not safe. I would recommend that you take a serious look at rewiring the whole house to make sure that the electrical connections are safe and sturdy and using grounding connectors, the so-called third wire ground. This is the old style plug, not totally old style because this one's a little wider there so that you can put in the polarized plug. A lot of them were just the same size. You could plug things in either way, which was a real issue with some of the old radios that actually had one side connected to the electrical. And you want to make sure that's the grounded side, which is the, the longer terminal. You want to replace those with this right here. Okay. Originally, when they did these, you could attach the ground to the conduit in which the wires went. It was metal conduit, but that's long gone. You need to re rewire the whole house with proper Romex and so on. You'll need to get your utility to come in and put a proper meter box and so on. This is not going to be inexpensive because you actually do need to run new wires. Now, there's a very good possibility that your house has been rewired for resale. I think a lot of realtors would say you're going to have a real hard time selling this house if it isn't wired with proper three wire outlets. Uh, go down to Home Depot or Lowe's and pick up or at Ace Hardware, True Value, whatever. There's a little test thing you can plug in to see if the ground is properly connected. You want to do the same thing that we do with all other grounding. Have the ground rod right outside the window of your shack or right as close as you can get it. Make sure that it's outside. Make sure that your lightning arresters attached to that and then bond that to the electrical ground. If there is no electrical ground that you can see, if you open the box and it's a new box, it will have a panel over on the side of that third wire ground. All comes to one place and that is attached to the neutral. That may be the only place you can get at it. Talk to an electrician before you do very much here. Somebody who's really good, not just a, a journeyman, but a master electrician because this is something that's a little outside of the ordinary. Yes, you should go through with the grounding. Yes, even if the rest of the building only has two wire plugs, make sure that your equipment is properly grounded. It could really help you, not only in the event of a lightning strike, but just for plain problems with grounding. Now, grounding is a very specialized uh, type of thing. I thought I knew a fair amount about grounding, and I will point out, this is the book with current amateur best practices for grounding. It is the second edition of Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur by H. Ward Silver and Zero AX. It's available directly from the ARRL or you can get it on Amazon. I would recommend you get the hardcover edition rather than the Kindle because there are diagrams in here that you're going to want to study really closely and you may find yourself underlining some things too. So grounding is a really serious issue and in an old 1930s house can be even more so. Some of the older homes even have what they call post and beam type uh, wiring in there where they run the wires parallel to each other with little posts, ceramic or glass posts holding the wires down, but otherwise they're next to each other. And let me show you one of the problems that you can run into with that. If this is your post and beam wiring again, looks like this, you've got a stud and on the side of it, you put this, it's an electrical insulator that looks 
about like this with little holes and you clamp down on it by putting something down in here which comes out the bottom okay and the wires run through these things like this now when there is a switch often what will happen is this wire will be run to a separate post and beam down to the switch this is not considered safe because you should be switching on the hot side okay and if the switch is off you've got current here not current here you can have some issues so what you want to do that post and beam stuff is long gone okay and you're going to run romex and you're going to run it all the way to the switch okay there's your switch on or off and then you're going to come out of here and go to the device okay none of this crossing over but you have both sides in here by the way this allows you to like put timers on it dimmers etc that you can put on it that you can't do with that old post and beam structure without creating some issues now talk to an electrician tell you also a little kind of a little known fact and that is in many states colorado being one of them you as the home owner not as the renter but as the home owner not a friend of yours but the home owner can do wiring in his or her own home okay now you still need a permit okay and if you don't do it right you'll fail your inspection you keep to need doing it right i wired an entire basement one time i had a friend who was an electrician teach me a few things and loan me a tool or two of his while I wired that thing. That was an interesting job because the first time the inspector came, there were just wires hanging out of the outlets that had not been trimmed back and connected and so on. He told me gently to do that. He came back again once I had done it and I passed everything. Now, another thing that you will find in older homes is this. You will find that you have circuit breakers like this okay and they come across they they switch to the neutral okay the neutral is if you look at a plug it's the longer of the two here they're wired to the neutral and then this goes out with a red wire this goes out with the white and this is black and it's positive this is red and it's positive and these go through separate breakers and then these go out to say a switch or a, an outlet out here and the reason that they do this you've got the positive current can also come back this side because this is 180 degrees out of phase so you can get loops like this and put less pressure on the neutral okay now this is no longer, they don't do this. You get a Romex, it's gonna have a black, which is the hot, a white, which is the neutral, and a green, or bare copper, which is the ground, the safety ground. And all those come in and attach to a strip over here, okay? And then this is the only point in the home. This will be grounded and attached to the, the power line neutral, which uh, in most services you will see a bare wire with two black wires wrapped around it. The bare wire is the power line neutral, and it gives the strength to this. Now, these incoming wires are... Uh, aluminum uh, they attach to special terminals in here that can take aluminum and fix that with copper remember this is old if your house is wired that way just be careful because you have a breaker here and a breaker here if you max out this breaker you can have a lot of current here and then if you max out this breaker you can have even more current coming here and it can cause issues and you shouldn't uh, do that okay now I'm not an electrician I don't know how backwards I got this if I did please note that in the comments if I did make an error in this please note this in the comments so that I can correct it what I'm trying to say is that for your 1930s home you really want to check this out with a qualified electrician to see how things are wired how they're built and I 
almost can guarantee you that in a house that old, if it was rewired years ago, it probably used that red wire technique that I talked to you about there. Talk to him about how to properly wire your ham station because if you have an amplifier, it can actually draw a fair amount of power. The normal 100 watts, actually because of the inefficiency in the linear amplifier at the end, it's closer to 200 watts, okay? 200 watts is two amps at 100 volts, but coming out of your power supply, you're converting 120 down to 12, and so 20 amps on that 12 volt line becomes uh, two amps for the circuit, which is not much. But my amplifier is a linear 500 watt amp, meaning it draws a thousand watts approximately to run the power supply. Uh, here, this is 75 amps going into here. Okay, so, so that's close to eight amps ish there plus the two amps here plus whatever you've got running in you can see that you're starting to move toward the 15 amp max for your circuit okay so talk to an electrician about that my primary concern is safety yes you will want to bond your station ground with your household ground and as i said it may be the only place you can do that if you run it up from the ground inside the main box where your circuit comes in from the external supply. Often it's buried, 1930s out, it is almost certainly an aerial line. So there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.